Well, I must say that my guest today has an impressive CV. So I have seen a little bit of Uber. I have seen a little bit of Accenture. Then I saw like the big universities like in Stanford, the, like the university, the SMU in Singapore. By the way, for those who don't know, getting the, into SMU is not easy at all. <laughs> you have you have to suffer. You, you, you need tears in order to get there. So he has also been working in, in venture capital. And I have the impression that kind of with all this experience, he had enough of how development and performance review are conducted in corporates. So he said, that's enough. And he found it on loop in 2020. Mm. Projal Gatak, I am so happy to have you here. And, and just to, to, to start the run. So there is many things that are being said about performance management. And I'm also thinking back about my days in, in corporate, how much I hated it from the manager perspective and also mm. as the receiver. Uh, mm. So there is a couple of numbers and it looks like there is kind of a, a, an alignment on not opinions, but it's kind of facts. So if you think about it, so there was Gallup mentioning in 2022 that only two in 10 employees believe that their company's performance management system motivates them to do their be best work. What do you think? Accurate. Or not? Accurate. Uh, that, yeah. True. So we have even the people who design this performance management, HR people. So there is 90% of HR leaders expressing their dissatisfaction with traditional performance reviews. Have you heard about it? About it? Accurate. True. <laughs> oh, talking about accuracy, 74% of employees say their performance reviews are not accurate, according to Gallup. True. Another one. And, and, and finally, let's talk about the, 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 the upcoming people joining the workforce, Gen Z and millennials. In fact, millennials have already joined way before. Almost 60% believe that their managers are unprepared to give constructive feedback during performance review. So the key job is not being done. What do you think? True. <laughs> All true. <laughs> Rogel, so tell me before we start discussing a little bit more about what is going wrong with this performance management and why do we keep it despite that everybody agrees? I, I think this is one of the few things in the human resources where everybody agrees that it's not working. So how did it come that after a, really, I'm, I'm kind of jealous of, you, uh, of your career, uh, so VC, Accenture, Uber, so how did you end up working and founding on loop? No, thank you, Ayman, and uh, thank you for that intro and thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, ultimately, I went about solving this problem because of personal pain. Because everything that you mentioned is is something I've experienced, and I think that the underlying sort of features of things like goals and feedback that are very, very important in organizations have been completely thrown away and have been treated like chores because of how much hate exists for performance management. And, and you know, Uber as a company started because the core taxi experience in a lot of countries wasn't great, right? And, and when a core experience is broken end to end, you kind of need to start from scratch and you kind of need to start fresh. And, you know, which is why um, it took us about a, about a couple of years to really rethink um, what managers need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And now we call that framework uh, collaborative team development as sort of an anti-performance management um, that, that achieves the right objectives without sort of the bureaucracy uh, and the paperwork. But, but to answer your question, it really was about solving personal pain. Uh, by the way, did you see major difference on the way that people are assessed in consulting versus startup mentality of Uber? Yeah, so I think the cultures are different, right? So I think one of the things that management consulting does really well as an industry is really focus on professional development um, and sort of the culture of regular feedback. Um, however, the processes and the tools for the formal processes are as backward in, in all organizations around the world. Um, and, and that's because 
the category in itself is broken. Um, and so there are thousands of quote unquote performance management tools out there, but they're all largely form filling exercises. Some, some prettier forms, some uglier forms, some with more questions, some with less questions, some with templated questions, et cetera. But they're all largely a form filling exercise um, that is rooted in compliance. And actually, if you go back to the history of performance management, um, it's about having records for decisions that you make around people to make sure companies don't get sued. Um, and we've converted a form filling compliance exercise into a development exercise, and that just doesn't work. Uh, and therefore, there is even a lot of confusion as to what is the purpose of doing this. Um, and, and often a lot of practices in HR or IT or in com compliance or risks are rooted in having to do paperwork and documentation around risk management. Um, and they just haven't modernized or haven't adjusted itself for the way modern companies should operate. I still remember you are right with this cumbersome administration that we that we have to do because I remember in average for one person I was devoting maybe close to one day and yeah. it was a, a one every year exercise so you cannot remember what happened so okay. I had notes but it wasn't I had notes that I was revising but it was not enough and then you have to craft like the beautiful sentence that substantiates the whole thing so it was really a waste of time because my boss wasn't looking at that yeah so totally. technology is opening a little bit the doors to to say it is not about writing two pages of of feedback that nobody's going to read but maybe yes. technology is helping us to really tag the pain points to identify the the, the label things cor correctly is that correct Prajal? No, totally. And, and you know, we've been working on this technology for about a couple of years now, and we've been very fortunate with the maturity of both predictive AI as well as generative AI products. Um, and exactly what you said around labeling or tagging unstructured data, AI has been good at doing for a while. Um, not even before the advent of generative AI. And now what generative AI is very good at doing is taking raw, unstructured observations and writing that in powerful narratives, actually much better than most human beings can. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of fear around, oh, like, should AI write performance reviews or how do we take the humanity away? But, but humanity is about making observations and having conversations. It's not about writing eloquent prose summarizing. There's a reason why vast majority of knowledge workers didn't take jobs as authors or, or book writers. And so report writing has been a key feature of the workplace. Um, and performance reviews is one example of that report writing process, uh, which we think should completely be eliminated in the workplace of the future, uh, which is Gen AI native. And, and which is why the new technology is incredibly powerful to help humans focus on what they do best. Um, and let technology do the work after that uh, to summarize, sort of remove uh, the right behaviors as insights, et cetera, um, and really augment uh, what humans feel. Hmm. I, I saw that Onloop has already, uh, already a good wealth of well-known companies using, uh, using the tool. So obviously you have tracked the way of ideally Uh, of the ideal elements for performance. What are those elements that are not, not considered in the traditional performance management that you have considered? Yeah, it's a really good question. And actually, um, this sort of culminated for us in late 2022 when we um, sort of put together everything we've learned uh, into a five-layer framework that we call collaborative team development. And, and really now we train managers On, on how to think about the key aspects of performance and the fact that there's a very clear hierarchy in terms of what matters uh, and what doesn't matter. And often managers with six to eight direct reports end up getting overwhelmed around um, how to actually go about driving peak performance in their teams. Um, and the bottom two layers of the five layer pyramid we call base performance. And those two layers are each person's energy 
and each person's goals. Yeah. And 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 a manager's job is to first and foremost make sure that teams are inspired, motivated, excited, and 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 really sort of approach their day to day work um, with with sort of zest and positivity. Um, and and often you know what people call burnout. Burnout is really people operating with very low levels of energy for a very long amount of time. Um, and in the past, managers used to sort of observe that more through osmosis, but now in a hybrid world, it is very important to be intentional to understand each person's energy level um, and track that in a much more um, sort of ongoing manner. Um, the second layer of that is people's goals. Uh, and actually, people have been talking about goals and how important goals are for a very long time. But a lot of the work that's been uh, put in place around goal frameworks have been very top down. So if you look at OKRs or KPIs or other approaches to goals, they're very good at helping businesses set their goals, but they very rarely cascade down to help every individual really understand what are the core things that they need to do. And so um, we look at goals as targets, projects, or skills. And actually, if you think about a lot of knowledge work, it's not possible to put each person's work into a well-crafted OKR. But what they're really doing is learning new things or starting new projects or sort of hitting certain input targets. And so getting really clear about what each person's goals are end up becoming the first two layers. And in fact, if most managers can just manage those two on a successful regular basis, all teams will be at least average performing. And then above the line, there are three layers that are very, very important. Obviously, people talk a lot about feedback. Um, and, and recognition feedback is important not just to motivate performance, but also to help people identify superpowers. So as you said, how can we extract the behaviors that are coming through that feedback to let someone know, actually, these are the three to five things they're really good at. And then the next layer is improved feedback, which often doesn't happen because emotion comes in the way. And again, for what is important in the improved feedback is extracting the behaviors um, or the specific um, sort of actions that the person can take. And finally, ensuring that people are learning and growing and that they're developing and they feel like they're progressing. And all of those five layers play a very core component to performance. Uh, and every manager needs to manage all of those five for every person on their team. And for lower performers, it's important to manage more at the bottom of that level. And then high performers who can manage their own energy, set their own goals, sort of really understand what they're good at. What they really need is improve feedback because they really want to grow. And then they want to understand what are ways that they can upskill and grow over time. And, and so we now teach companies um, sort of a five-layer framework on how to think through managing every team member on an ongoing basis. I love the framework. But listen, I, I, I have to dig a little bit more into this sure. with goals. Because back in the days, I'm older than you, Prajal, I have to tell you. Uh, <laughs> back in the days, we were using these awful smart goals, which yes. nobody could understand. So for more than 20 years, I was drafting smart goals that I didn't understand. Uh, <clears throat> then there was a couple of years back, OKRs. And suddenly, yeah. you, Prajal, you are destroying my belief that OKRs are helping. You are saying it's not perfect. Tell me more about that. <laughs> no, and actually, if you look at the history, if you talk to if you talk to most companies that have implemented OKRs, the only people who celebrate it are at the top of the organization, and and that's because it helps CEOs and leaders set goals for the business in a way that in a way that works. Ooh. But every OKR implementation process is a complete nightmare in Ooh. organizations. Usually, takes about a quarter to set up. They are very complicated. And then one month later, no one looks at them and it's done. And then when it comes to the next cycle of assessing individual or business performance, people are back to making stuff up. And so it's a great practice in theory, but it gets unfortunately not successfully trickled down into organizations. And for us, we, we sort of had the mission of really measuring work at the bottom of the organization in a fair and equitable manner. And therefore, we sort of came up with our goal framework around targets, projects, and skills that are better able to articulate what each person does, 
and therefore what every team does. And then you got to make it very easy to link those individual or team targets to company level targets um, or, or OKRs, which most companies have to then understand sort of how things flow through. But the, but the notion of goals cascading through organizations is really where magic happens and where people can produce peak productivity. And that cascading process has unfortunately not been successful with a lot of the frameworks that are out in the market. So you say target projects and skills, um, but does it include the fact, uh, does it include like behaviors? Like me, uh, let's say that I'm a, an accountant, I need to have yeah. specific behaviors for my job. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to skills, right? Skills can be both behavioral skills as well as sort of domain expertise or hard skills. And actually the most important skills are courage, curiosity, and confidence. Because if you have those three, then you can learn anything yeah. and, and, and develop everything on top of it. And so as we sort of enter a world of generative AI in knowledge work, actually the hard skills will become even less important. But what is deeply human and what is deeply behavioral will be the skills that, that matter more. And, and we talk a lot about skills-based organizations and, and hiring for skills. The reality is that there is extremely poor data on what skills people actually have. And, yeah. and which is why we very much started with feedback and the input layer to really understand people's skills because where that skill data exists is actually hidden in feedback. And to really understand what skills people have and what skills people need to or want to develop, it really starts with feedback um, and getting feedback right. But it's then important to round that out with, with sort of goals and continuous learning as the right way to think about it holistically. What is, what is incredible is that in a human sentence, let's say we talk for one minute, there is so much wealth of information like, and with artificial intelligence, you are able to spot and, and I don't know, put in the right boxes things so that you can understand what is the, uh, if there was really, was it an input? Was it something that needed to be improved? Was it something that he wishes to, uh, to yes. improve? It, that, that is quite amazing. Huh? In one single sentence, so much data. <laughs> no. A driven analysis and, and the use of data for things that were easier to quantify. And what Gen AI does, it allows us to adopt data-driven approaches to what in the past was difficult to measure or difficult to quantify. And that's where the technology is beautiful in sort of augmenting human ability to make observations with machine ability to extract insight. And, and that combination together is super powerful. Hmm. <clears throat> How far do you think we we can dream about the 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 use of artificial intelligence in order to support uh, individuals and uh, and business performance? How far can we can we dream? Can can we ask them? How can I do this now? Because in especially Projal in in learning it's like training. For instance, in corporate training has been always like a, a, a full mess. Nobody really learns. So only maybe three percent of attendants might be learning something and, and they have acquired a uh, skill because of a, a, a training, but yeah. practice, uh, practice is required. And we need, sometimes we ask questions on the, on the job and we don't have the answers right away in a short manner, very specific. So do you think that AI can, can go and really help on, help us on that also? I think we're just getting started, right? So there's one McKinsey paper that talks about how 70% of the work that knowledge workers are doing can be automated with Gen AI. And, and only 30% of what we do day to day is actually value add um, or innovative or creative in terms of original thought. Because if you think about knowledge work, it's a lot of form filling and a lot of coordination of various types. And so if we can focus everyone's energy to having the right conversations and ideate and create and all of the paperwork and form filling and documentation 
just happens magically behind the scenes and then maybe gets edited or or sort of tweaked um imagine the time savings that would create imagine if ceos didn't have to write board decks and those board decks would get created magically by ai sort of having a view of what's happened in the company in the last 3 or 6 months and really thinking through what the right narrative for the business is and and if you think about it if you gave ai access to every conversation every every sort of piece of creative work and then asked it to summarize what happens there is no reason why why ai couldn't do it now it's going to be garbage in garbage out so if you don't have the right observations it's going to hallucinate it won't be perfect so you'll have to add the 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 end 20% but actually where most projects fail or where most projects are time consuming is in the middle 20 to 80% but now humans can kick off things by the first 20% and then round that out by the last 20% and then let technology be the piece in the middle. And that's why people are talking about AI employees and AI workers that will work hand in hand with humans. And that means that you know one person can get a lot done with three or four AI workers that works those middle sections, but humans are able to set it up and finish it off the runway. And so, you know, I... I I truly believe that this technology is the most powerful thing that we've seen since the internet. Um, I think it is more transformative than mobile. Um, but you know, if you think about crypto and Web3 and Gen AI as like the two waves of technology in the last few years, I think there is no comparison on the transformational impact Gen AI can have on the productivity of knowledge workers around the world. And I think there are 1.5 billion knowledge workers globally. Um, and I think there's going to be a massive shift, disruption, change in how things get done in the next decade or so. And it's it's super exciting. What I have noticed is that maybe because of COVID, uh, a lot of human resources people have finally waken up and said we need alternatives to what we were doing before because COVID made that all this mess of leaders who didn't know how to manage remotely people, how to empathize to people who were feeling alone, learning new processes just by themselves. Um, this sense of collaboration, despite that you are sitting in different offices, um, that that was a major pain. So there, are, there has been a big chunk of human resources people looking for alternatives outside of what the traditional stuff. <clears throat> now, the problem is that is still human the human resources capabilities and understanding of technology is still yeah. not awesome. <laughs> and, 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 and what would be your recommendation, your message for human resources to say, hey, how can you learn new stuff quickly so that you choose things that are worthwhile, that bring really impact and not the, the cover your ass solutions like okay let's spend millions and millions in sap hr mo module to help us and uh, we, what we have is a copy and paste of a process that didn't work in the past uh and yeah. that sucks and instead of trying new stuff like on loop like, for instance but there is many like, kind of on loops for but, sure. but on loop yeah. for instance so so i i think that it's important to study history because history often repeats itself over and over again. So if you think about the IT organization uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, um, they bought crappy products. And, and that's because they cared more about the security, the compliance, the privacy, the integrations, the documentation, the interoperability, all of these things over and above the end user experience. And, and in Silicon Valley, really smart engineers and designers in the last 10 or 15 years have built Slack, Trello, Notion, Asana, Gmail, Zoom, um, that has completely revolutionized how work gets done. Um, and and we started building products for enterprise IT in a deeply consumer manner. Um, and, and for us, we're effectively doing the same thing for the HR stack. 
but reimagining it from the lens of a manager or a team member and what they need to get their work done and they need to understand team performance and they need to ensure teams are growing and learning versus run a process for a functional organization. And, and frankly, we look at the manager as the most important person to serve because there's now really good data in the last few weeks from The Economist and McKinsey how managers are more burnt out than ever before um, and have largely been ignored in this productivity boom that's been focused on individual productivity versus sort of helping managers be more effective. And we wouldn't have come up with what we've come up, frankly, if we focused on the HR organization versus the manager organization in terms of what their needs are, because the needs of those organizations are very, very different. And, and often the early adopters in an organization are working on the forefront of innovation versus in more risk management functions and, and, and HR and IT and finance end up being very important risk management functions for the organization. But that often means that they don't take on a very strong early adopter mentality mm. on, on how to adopt new products or how to think about new things. And so we often talk to the business first uh, because ultimately we serve the needs of the business um, and the needs of their managers to drive greater clarity in their teams and, and increase productivity. Um, but, I, but I think that it is, it is important for folks working in functional organizations that they have a dual purpose to their jobs. And it's very hard to do that. They need to risk manage for the organization, but they also need to help the organization move forward. And what becomes very important is then have the right relationship with the business so that they can collaborate with the business and with early adopters in the organization to really think about sort of what their needs are and then design tools, processes, approaches um, that meet the needs of that end user. And so ultimately, we need to stay very end user focused to innovate and to give people experiences, not check boxes. And that comes from a very strong customer obsession and an obsession on the end user, which in our case, the most important person is the manager. Totally. Uh, now, we have been discussing individual performance that obviously is going to contribute to the end business outcomes or, or results of a corporation. Now, there is also um, a major challenge for organization, which is how to create, craft a culture that is mm. healthier. You have been talking about burnout, men uh, uh, mental health, or that it is more productive where people are more curious. So whatever they, they, they decide to 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 be uh, as a as a new culture in, in a lot of people a lot of companies are still in in the process of changing uh i remember numbers of the middle east there was 60 of companies who were onboarded in any type of transformation change that included uh culture now yeah does is it possible to to uh, to work with on loop in order to drive a new culture yeah so so you know we we use the term clarity a lot. Um, and, and, and in a world that is noisy, in a world that is hybrid, in a world of uncertainty, what builds health in organizations is people having clarity. Clarity of purpose and meaning. Clarity on what they need to do to succeed. Clarity on what are their superpowers. Um, clarity on how they're learning and growing. And so what we try and do for companies is that with everything in the on-loop app, we convert that into a clarity score. And then we give managers and individuals next actions to take on where they can enhance their clarity. And for some reason, in some organizations, people may not have clarity on goals. And that's where enhancing clarity is more important. In some mm -hmm. cases, People might be operating at very low energy levels and then helping people find purpose and meaning is more important. In some cases, people might think like they're not learning and growing. And in those cases, building a feedback culture and ensuring people are learning new things becomes very important. Um, but ultimately, we believe that cult any culture that has deep clarity 
and allows people to perform at their optimal productivity is is a good culture now i i i think culture ultimately although also boils down to the leader of the organization and which is why we will very rarely work with organizations that are not bought in at the leadership level to drive the change that onloop can drive in those organizations because leaders need to be bought in and leaders have to lead by example around the change they want to drive so if leaders are saying hey we want very clearly defined targets projects and skills for every individual but the company doesn't have it it's not going to happen well, because people are going to learn from what behaviors they see at the top um and people are largely going to mimic or emulate what they see in their leaders and so you know when i first started the company what i what i realized is that my blind spots started becoming the company's blind spots because ultimately for many founders the organization becomes a representation of who they are um and one of the things that i actively work on is how do we create sort of antidotes or immune systems in the organization to things that are deficient in me as a person um and and i and i think that leaders need to always understand what are the consequences intended or unintended of of who they are on their cultures and and then be very intentional about how they then put practices rituals dialogues conversations in place to then build the culture they want right and i'll give you an example i am not the world's most organized person but <laughs> to run a very successful business we have to be a deeply dependable reliable organization and it becomes very important for me to be very cognizant of that mm -hmm. um and very intentionally design things that ensure that we drive the culture that we want and not the culture that becomes automatic as a result of personalities of leadership and and often the personalities of leadership drives culture of organizations versus that being more intentional does that answer the question yes absolutely by the way while you were talking i was i was thinking that i saw the posting the, this uh that you have recently posted about your cto your co-founder yeah. yeah and i was thinking but these guys they should have complementary skills because yes for instance I, you were talking about organization i was thinking yeah maybe he looks more organized <laughs> than projal now that he mentioned it <laughs> Not correct and and I think that when CEOs craft their leadership teams I think it's very important to be intentional about making sure you're not hiring people who have the same strengths as you mm -hmm. uh they need to have the same values they need to have the same sort of drivers of who they are as people if there's if there's values misalignment often that's tough uh but it's very very important to be complementary and often leaders hire who they like and more often than not the people they like are people they have lesser friction with because they are similar and they get along but but that's good for a night out at the pub it's not great for running a company absolutely um tell me regarding the the, the frequency that performance management should be conducted so yeah. it has been there is the usual uh, once per year uh, we we talk about it uh, and then there is Now some radical people saying, "Oh, we should just ditch the the full thing." I I still remember that the ex, the the, the ex founder, I mean the founder of Twitter, uh, who mm. is now in another company, he said, "Just claim one month ago, I will not do any performance management uh, in my new company." What is your take on that project, Projan? Yeah, so so I think again, this is a nuanced, complicated topic. Now, if you think about why people do once a year. it's because they make compensation changes once a year yes and 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 then the performance management process becomes the process through which bonuses and raises get decided and and that and therefore in organizations there's a very hard to untie link between compensation management um and performance management now we we sort of operate the business largely to quarters and i think most people operate businesses to quarters and i and i think that if you're managing your business on a quarterly basis 
then it becomes very important to quarterly take a look at how your people are doing. Um, and are they on track? Uh, where are they doing really well? Where they can improve? And and take next steps on on how they should run. And so we generate our AI reports called Prisms in the product, and we recommend most customers do that quarterly and and build that cadence into the business in terms of having the right quarterly conversation. And then very good managers when they have weekly one on ones or convert one monthly one-on-one into a development conversation, then you can have minor cadences that get built out in how managers do things. But essentially, businesses have a weekly cadence, which is the one-on-one. Um, they have monthly or quarterly business reviews. And, and then there is sort of an annual board meeting. Well, some, a lot of companies have quarterly board meetings, but an annual general meeting or some sort of financial results for the year. And then each of those have different levels of intensity on how it's done. So, so I think the wrong question to ask is how often it happens. I think the right question to ask is what is the depth of conversation that's happening mm-hmm. at, at different points in time? Um, but I think most people would say it's very much a continuous conversation. Now, you can't make every weekly one-on-one a development conversation. So I think that is unwarranted. Uh, but every weekly one-on-one conversation should have a check-in on people's goals um, and and have an aspect of feedback into it. Uh, but then on a monthly or quarterly basis, you can then look at it holistically. And then on a six monthly or annual basis, you can then look at it comparatively across the organization and then decide sort of where raises or promotions, et cetera, happen. So I think the I think the at the one-on-one level between manager and direct report, that's much more um a weekly process as it becomes about comparing across the org and calibrating people and doing ratings or raises, I think that then becomes a semi-annual or annual process. Um, I was just thinking loud about how difficult it is to convince an organization to invest in a new performance management system. And the reason yeah. is because many organizations have got the same system for 10 years, 15 years, and maybe back in the days and with all the upgrades, they needed a lot of a bunch of German consultants with nice glasses coming uh, coming to the organization, paying millions. So they have invested a lot. Um, yeah. And suddenly maybe a, a, a small company, a startup will tell them there is better ways to do it and yeah. can pay in a SaaS model and, and so on. So yeah. how do you convince these people to say, forget about your 10 million investment now you yeah. can pay much more or less, but have results. Yeah. So I think a couple of things. I think one, people should never be investing in systems for the sake of systems. Mm-hmm. And and in the last 10 years with the software boom, with cloud computing and the ease of adopting software, there's actually been an explosion of adopting software tools without really thinking about why it's being why it's being implemented or what is the change that can be drive. And so we talk about on loop much more as a program versus a system or a tool. And we usually like, even if a, even if a company has 10,000 people, we actually like working with an org that between 50 and 500, where we'll work with that PNL leader or the department leader to drive change in the org. Because I don't want someone to implement something for 10,000 people unless there's strong advocates. And and I'd rather do that internally first versus pitch to a CHRO and say, transform your 10,000 person company. Because frankly, I am more interested in making feedback change and how it happens in organizations and drive a cultural sort of transformation versus sell software. And unfortunately, Many companies have built great businesses by selling software versus driving outcomes. And I care a lot more about driving outcomes versus selling software. Uh, Projal, uh, you got me. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's the first time that somebody mentions their solution as a program. And it just because you are not selling the software, the, a technology, you are ch- uh, se- uh, selling the outcome which means that people have to change because behind all this feedback, people have to do it, the co- conduct habits, ritu- new rituals in the organization. Yes. Without that, without this approach of change management, you're, I mean, it will end up 
in the trash bin, regardless Correct. of how awesome it can be your your software, no? Correct. Correct. So we we very much see our jobs as habit building, and to your point, driving those micro habits. And we obsess a lot about what builds habits. And we've seen great examples in the fitness industry. Uh, we've seen great examples in social media. We see a lot of great consumer examples of how habits get driven. Uh, and Neer Eyal, who wrote this book called Hooked and is a habit-forming expert, is someone I know personally. And he's been very helpful in helping me think through it. Um, but they're very clear. They're pretty clear elements of what forms habits. Um, and it's very important to surgically apply the same principles uh, to how habits get formed about just about anything. Um, and so we very much look at us as a habit building company for the benefit of individual and team and manager performance um, versus fitness or entertainment or, or other aspects. But the principles are not different in how habits get formed. Mm. Uh, Rajal, so we are almost at the end of this uh, episode about uh, performance management. And really, th I think that we have discussed more about the change, the tr this transition that is happening today, uh, and even the applications that could happen and are happening because of artificial intelligence. How can people yeah. ask you more questions, get to know more about the loop? Tell me how to reach you out. Yeah, so LinkedIn is probably the best way. And so if you search for On Loop as a company name um, or JJ or Projol Katak for me, um, I read every I read every message that comes in my LinkedIn mailbox. I may not always respond to every message that comes to my LinkedIn mailbox, uh, but I but I do read everyone. And so for anyone interested in learning more or having a conversation, I'd 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 love for them to reach out. Thank you very much, Projal. It was really insightful, interesting, and really so much aligned about what I think about the change that is required uh, on corporations. Really, I, I, I love the discussion. I have learned a lot. Thank you very much, Projal. Have no, a thank you, Ivan. Thank you for having me.